so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Peter. Um, Peter was born in Czechoslovakia and moved to Australia in uh, sometime in the 90s. Uh, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Plant Pathology from the Martin Luther University of Hull Wittenberg in Germany and a PhD in Entomology from the Slovak Academy of Sciences. And um, in Czechoslovakia, uh, Peter worked at the Slovak Department of Prime Industries as a research entomologist and has also been here in the South Australian Museum in, in the Department of Terrestrial Invertebrates as a volunteer in the Diptera collection. Uh, the University of Adelaide as a research fellow on two occasions, first on confocal laser microscopy and then on X-ray imaging. And we'll see a couple of images in this presentation tonight. But it was also a research fellow at the Novartis Pharmaceutical Institute in Vienna, Austria, uh, and research drugs against inflammation, and has continued that work as a senior scientist at Bionomics in South Australia on the development of drugs against epilepsy, depression, PTSD, multiple sclerosis, and cancer. Currently, Peter's working from home, he proudly says, as a scientific consultant to Australian biotech companies that are developing drugs against diseases of the central nervous system. But in his spare time, Peter describes new gall midges of Australia and Oceania, South and East Asia, and occasionally Africa and South America. Written reviews and identification keys to gall midge fauna of Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Indonesia. Thank you very much for coming, Peter. We welcome you to give your presentation. We're talking about gormages today. Gormages is a large, I need to. Very good. That, that, that'll do. Yes. So they are insects. And it's a quite a large family. It contains about 7,000 species described on this planet. They are quite small. Their wing size is between two to four millimeters. So it's very small. So the biggest species I've described was from South Africa. And it had a wing size of whopping six millimeters, which in this sort of, for this family is huge. So that's like one and a half centimeters wingspan enormous so normally they are much smaller now they are often nicely colored especially the larvae so when you encounter larvae of hymenoptera or some uh, other insects they're usually white but these guys are either pink or red or yellow different so and that's a, a giveaway so if you have if you find the larvae they are you know something like this here uh, yellow in color. And what is special about them, they have this chitinized structure, like that, this one here. It's like a fork. It's a chitinized fork on the breast, which, called, which is called the spatula stenalis. Mm. And they use it as an anchor point for the end of the body, where they, they, they uh, bend the body, put the end of the body behind the spatula, then release it. And the larva, which is about one and a half millimeters to two millimeters long, so tiny, can do jumps of 10 centimeters, which is very good if you want to look for a nice, juicy uh, pupation side in the soil, or if you see any birds that would eat you. So this is quite specific for the for these gormages. Now, of these 8,000 species which are described, many more undescribed, of course, uh, most of them are plant feeders. So about 80% are plant feeders. The rest is either fungus feeders or predators of aphids, uh, mites, and other insects. It's always the larva that it's feeding. So despite they are not enormously mobile, they still can hunt other prey. But again, most of them are plant feeders. Uh, now, because of that, they feed on plants and they can influence the population of the particular plant. 
So that can actually, they can kill the whole population locally, not the whole species. They actually did uh, annihilate the whole plants from small countries. But, you know, we know the nature does. It comes with uh, parasites that start eating on them. So they do still influence uh, quite drastically the population of their host. And if it's a host plant, which is good, then they are, uh, they are pests, right? If the host plant is wheat, then they are control agents. So it all depends what sort of plant they feed on. Uh, now, we call them gormages because they create uh, a structure on the body of the plant, which is a tumor. So here, this is an x-ray image. That's all I can do. <laughs> so this goal here is about one millimeter in diameter. And you can find it on the ends of the branches of the colitis plants. So this particular uh, tumor is originally a flower plant flower. Uh, so what happens, the, the female lays the eggs on the on soft tissue, and when the larva hatches, it starts nibbling on the plant, on the, on the juice of the plant, and starts, you know, uh, getting the nourishment. But it also injects cytokines and other growth uh, hormones into the plant. So by coevolution, these gormages developed uh, a synthesis of a plant growth hormones, which are inject, inject into the plant, and they change a particular uh, organ of the plant. Now, uh, they are very often host specific. So a particular uh, gall mitch species would have as a host only a single host plant. Sometimes it could be more than one within the same genus of the, of the plant, and very rarely from these 8,000 species, we have only about under 10, which are actually polyphagous, that they would eat anything really. So they are very, uh, very narrow in their host range. And any organ of the plant can be created or changed into, into, the, into the tumor, into the gall. Here we have four examples of which plant tissue can be changed to a gall. Here you can see a wattle. And if the flower of the plant is not um, uh, infested, you would have a normal pot like this one here or that one. However, if there is infestation by the gall mage, you have this uh, gall, this tumor. There are no seeds. When you crunch them open, you see in this case, a lot of larvae. In this case, they are yellow, but there's no seed. So this part of the plant is infertile here, this here. So this is an example of a leaf gall. So this is a Halosakia plant, and these are the leaves here. And then if there is an infestation by the larva, this will happen. So it's a very strange structure. Mm -hmm. And it's actually triggered by the cocktail of cytokines, of plant hormones. So this is the coevolution through millions of years, where different species of uh, gall images created a different chemical inside them, and injected them into the plant. And then, when they start injecting the, the plant hormones, the tissue goes around them and encapsulates them, and they are inside. And, you know, uh, safe from sun, from wind, from elements, and relatively same, safe from parasitoids too. I mean, parasites always find their way. So they have infrared sensors. They know that there is lava inside, inside the tissue, so they would drill a hole and and still inject the la uh, the eggs into into these larvae too. That's how it is, right? Uh, here is an example of a branch gall. It's a eucalyptus, and you can see a a three lava chambers on the on the on in a gall. So this is one, two, and three. And inside of these three chambers, you have always one lava. And it can also create galls on roots. They would not go into the soil, so they would go for plants which have an aerial roots, like, like these uh, strobilantes, which grows in, uh, 
in central uh, Java. So this is Mount Geddes in, in Indonesia. And the, the plants of this genus grow, grow on very steep uh, part of the volcanoes there. And in order to survive in the wind and, and the inclination and the water, they actually are using aerial roots to actually anchor themselves better. But then the roots are naked. So again, a, a species evolved through the millions of years that actually creates these tumors, these gores on, on, the, on the roots. So you can see this is a, a root, right? It would be like this here on the slope. And then you have these tumors. So it's, you know, there's, there's probably about 30 of them. And this is a, a cross section and inside the lava chamber and inside you have the lava. So now these tumors are so specific that in countries where you have season where there are no flowers and no leaves, like in Europe in winter, the botanists actually know these goals and they stay there during the winter, like dry structures. And because they know the goals they actually can tell what plant species it is. So they are so specific. Right. I've got a couple of slides about the history of the study of Australian Golmages. And it all started in 1857 to 1859 with the Novara expedition. So this was a time where the first three Golmages of Australia were described, collected and described. And uh, Novara was a frigate, an Austrian frigate, which went around the world and they were collecting uh, stones, uh, plants and insects. And here you can see the frigate departing Venice, which at the time was part of Austria. Austria. I mean, that's funny about European cities. You know, they change hands. <laughs> My grandfather was born and stayed in the same town for his whole, whole life, and he changed four countries, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, right. So they, yes. So they departed Vienna and spent a couple of years around the world. <laughs> world. And they collected three species in uh, the Sydney area. Now, on the right hand side, you see Ferdinand von Hettenstedt, something like that, who was a geologist. And it's not a good drawing, but you can see a lot of stuff there. So you see some stones. Uh, I don't know where was it? Uh, the hammer here, the geologist's hammer, pictures of his family. And this is a gun. So in those days, it was probably quite dangerous to be a geologist for some reason. So they have, they've been armed. So there were several uh, naturalists on the ship and they've collected and reared free species in Sydney area. And then when they returned, they gave it to Josef Schinner, who was a, a entomologist in the Vienna the National uh, the Museum of Natural History. And they described the species uh, in 1800, uh, I think 60 something. And then when I was doing the revision of Australia, I asked the Vienna Museum, Museum to send me, you know, the, the, the types. And they've sent not only the dried uh, uh, insects, but also the plants. So this, this, this is the picture of the original specimen collected, you know, in 18, uh, I think they were here, 1858. So they sent that to me. And, you know, I got the, the insects, uh, you know, put them into ethanol, you know, cut them and made the kind of the bottom slide and then redo the, uh, the, the morphology. And you can see part of the paper here. So you see here the male terminalia here. Uh, you see the palpus, so the uh, palpus around the mouth. So interestingly, uh, despite they do not take food, the adults, they still have functioning mouth parts. Now, the reason is, especially for the females, to actually use it as a sensory identification of the plant. I mean, these insects are clever. They can detect a single molecule of a particular plant on their antennae. So they are really enormously efficient chemical machines, right? We still can't do it, right? Uh, the other way to identify the plant is not just the smell, but the taste. So the female would actually graze on the plant and check it. So they would look at the, the, the trichomes, you know, to, to do a tick, and then they would actually taste the plant and see if it's the, the particular species they, they want to attack or they want to actually use for reproduction. And here you see actually a photo of this particular species taken a couple of tens of years later. So if 
the if there's no infestation, you would have a, a fruit like this one here. Now, if the flower before it becomes a fruit is infested, you would have these tumors. So you have one, two, and three. And this particular species, I think larvae are yellow. You crush it open, you crack it open, and see a lot of larvae. Just one. There are several, several, yes. And most species, they, some insects do a pheromone, so where they mark, the female will mark the, the, the place. So it would tell, which would tell the, the other females they are already eggs there, don't do that. But these, these species, these, these, these guys don't, don't do that. So you can have actually a, a eggs from a, from a different female inside. So, and then the number of the larvae depends if it's just one female that laid the eggs there uh, or if it's more. So in this case, you would have about 50 to 60. Some species would have only one, so it all depends. This is the uh, second era of the study. I let you read the CV of this of this person, and then I talk again. Not a very productive scientist. I mean, give me a break. It took me 25 years to describe as many species as him. <laughs> and he also described and scientifically and named one of the most dangerous animals on this planet, the Asian tiger mosquito, which transmits a lot of diseases, you know, yellow fever, whatnot. So, I mean, obviously you cannot make HR people happy, can you? <laughs> so, so that's my, so that's my hero, right? Because of his work in the trial. <laughs> so I could not resist and name a genus after him. And here you see a she-oak, right? So these are the flowers. Sorry, once again, these are the leaves, you know, the, the spikes. And if there is an infestation by the, by the gourmet, you have these galls, so these tumors. They look like fruits, but they are not. The fruits are more fuller. And you know, like a shiny, a very hard tissue. So these are really elaborate structures. In this case, there's only one lava inside. So you crack it open and see the lava, which is quite stunning. But they're not big. No, no, they are about probably the size, probably less than one centimeter. So quite tiny. But if you have a lot of insects, right? Like I worked, I did my PhD on lentil gourmet. And that particular species, tiny species, killed the whole lentil production in France in the 60s. So they had moved it, they had to move it to different parts of France. They could not, it was not viable. It was just destroying all the all the all the uh, all the lentil production. They had to stop in the uh, 40s in, 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 in Hungary. So I was working on it in uh, in the 80s, where it was in Czechoslovakia, because it was a cash crop. So they can do, they are small but they can do a lot of damage. Like viruses can, they are small too, right? And see what they can do, right? So if it's a lot of little things, they can just uh, be very... Yes, yeah, but, yeah, but once you find one, you get hooked. So then you just look and suddenly... Uh, well, they are. These are the gold midges I'm talking about. So a diptera, you have hemiptera. And you can have also complex or which are as big as this. You can, you know, you can defend yourself, right? And some some uh, parts actually eat them. So they are a little bit different. So they can be big too. Then you have they have goals by fungi, you know, the hexen basin, the, the the witch, it's a witch grooms, right? Which is created by fungus. That's a goal too. So they are big ones. These are mainly small ones. But because they are host plant specific, they play quite an important role in agriculture, forestry, horticulture, and ecology. And that's the thing, right? Taxonomy is enormously boring. You just sit and do drawings, right? Could be quite tedious. But because 
each species has its own story, right? And it's important. Then it makes it sort of more fun. And I, I have a couple of stories about how some of the species have been described internationally, because they can travel, you know, they can take uh, an aeroplane and go to Japan, these bonishes, right? So it's a dynamic uh, uh, family. So this is the second uh, era, and this is uh, 1992 from now. So uh, I came to Australia in 17th of July, 1992. That's where my contribution is. So currently, uh, most of Australian species, the types, you know, the holotypes and the, uh, the tin types are placed in this particular building. So that's the South Australian Museum. So when I describe a new species, I design, I do the slides, I design the, the holotype, which is the number one, right? And I place that one and a couple of uh, thin types with it in the museum here. And I sent some to Washington on ca camera too, you know, the Australian National uh, uh, Collection, right? If it's from another country, the whole type goes to that particular, to that particular country. And I put some prototypes here. So this museum is in quite a big collection of, of, of this family currently now. It's a nice photo, isn't it? It's, it looks, I mean, no wonder people come here and want to live here. <laughs> and it's for free, right? Beautiful. So it's really a nice, uh, nice area of Adelaide. So I have a couple of examples of these goals. And I have some stories to tell you about, you know, how we found these goals and what they do. So here you see uh, a, a, a two, four, six, eight, a couple of species that each is different species and each feeds on another uh, wattle species. So here you can see Dacinero rubiformis on a black wattle. I mean, all flowers have been uh, transformed into goals, not a single uh, seed. And we come to that later because we know black wattle is a problem in South Africa. And we know these guys feed on the on one plant species, not like a frog that we did everything for rabbit. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. And what, probably you know this one here. That's the pendula, the acacia. And you can see, you know, it's, it's silvery. And sometimes all the flowers are actually converted into, into the goals. So from all these here, there's only one picture which has actually a healthy pod with seeds. And it's this one here. I mean, when you, when you describe a species, you show also sometimes the healthy plant. And then you show infestation. This is a part where you show what the, the, what the animal does. And so you hear, you know, all these uh, flowers have been changed to, to goals. Mm -hmm. You can actually describe a species not on the morphology or DNA of, 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 of the insect, but on these goals. It's the work of animal, which actually qualifies as a uh, way to describe a new species. We don't do it because, you know, we now have more time and uh, uh, you know, resources you want to do properly, but you still can. So these these uh, structures are very important because they are specific to the particular uh, species. Uh, right. So this is uh, the scarlet banksia, a beautiful plant. Right. It it, it grows naturally in uh, southeast of Western Australia, and for couple of, for sometimes. The cut flowers, which were exported to uh, USA and Japan, were sent back with a note that they have some insects on them. So then I was contacted by the growers. And then uh, in the end, we actually found out that these gauze, so they, these tumors here, which are nice for a biologist, but when you are somebody who actually receiving the plants, right, as a, as a birthday present, right, maybe not, right? So. So these are the goals, and when you crack it open, you see, uh, I think it's orange lava. So, you know, we, 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 you, we read it, uh, make slides, and did the DNA. So now we know it's a, it's a pest. So if there's a possibility to stop the outbreak of a particular pest, you could try to do it mechanically, you know, just, just burn the plants, 
right? So, because it's not easy to chemically, uh, you know, uh, control these insects. You can also do other 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 things like growing other plants around, you know, your your farm, uh, because the parasitoids of these species are not specific for the for the gormage species. So they would eat on other gormage species, and then they would multiply when there is an abundance of any of those. So you can actually dampen. Uh, you know, you can control it by by cultural measure, by measures by growing something that promotes uh, the parasites. Now, this one here does not do any goal. It uses the, the protected space between the leaves. So this is the, the the flex lily, which grows everywhere here in New Zealand too, and you can buy it in Bunnings. So in order to actually assess the whole host range of this particular species, I went into Bunnings and was just checking all the speakers because this one eats about four different species which are related to the plants, in different varieties. And I actually just looked and did have ticks because they, they are there, but you know, it's a new species. The growers did not know at the time. So, I mean, that's quite strange. You know, you go to your garden, you know, wholesale and, and, and look for a, a, a house range of a new species. That's Australia. And there you can see the larvae. You see here some birds figure out that some of these structures contain juicy, nice larvae. And they actually crack, crack them open and feed on them. So they are, they must be nutritious. So these, uh, these big ones, are probably uh, brothers or sisters. Often in this in this family, a female has a pro uh, has uh, a progeny only of one sex. It's either females or males. So it could be that these are only males or only females. But this one here is younger. It's probably about a week or ten days younger, and that must be coming from a different uh, different females. And this is the that that's part of the description. So you see the, the the male here. Now this one is beautifully colored. Mostly they are quite grayish, so not not that beautiful. But this one is exception. And you can see so the terminalia is here, the genitalia is here. That's the uh, that's the genitalia of the male. That's the 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 penis here. This is the the end of the head. This is one of the uh, antennal segments. So the antennae are used for measuring the speed of the wind, uh, smelling uh, the plant or the, the females. So it's really like a small factory, mm -hmm. uh, chemical factory. Uh, then this is the mouth with the palpi, the wing and uh, the claws. So there are tens of morphological characters I can use to identify the species, which is you know lovely because if you study nematodes, it's not much there you can actually use, right? And before the DNA era, it was really difficult. Here, it's relatively easy. So when I describe a new species, I got three groups of information coming in. First is the goal shape and the host plant. Then is the morphology of the animal and then it's DNA. So we do the cytochrome oxygen ox uh, unit number one. To, to, to sequence that's about uh, you know a, a small part of a genus uh, of, 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 of a gene which, which we you know sequence and uh, then lodge with uh, with a uh, gene bank and that helps us to describe the species. So that's part of the description you can see here uh, that's the antennal segment of the female and that's the end of the body of the female and it's the ovipositor that's this part here. Uh, Laterally, this is uh, ventrally. That's the head of a larva, one of the segments of the larvae. Sorry, pupa. That's pupa. This is the head of the larva. That's the spatula. That's the, the breastbone. And that's the end of the body. So there are very many characters one can use to describe the species. So this is an interesting example. So we described the species about four years ago. And it's really weird. This gormage infests an endemic plant, which has only about probably 500 plants left, so not many. And 
a group who tries to save it, notice that most of the fruits are infertile. So they do not have often situation like this, where you can see nice and healthy fruits, which would bear uh, the seeds here. So this one and this one is a healthy plant. However, about 95% of their plants cannot have seeds because they are infested by this particular species of gormich. So instead of having this long and healthy uh, fruit capsule, you have these gauze. So these are here. You can see the pupil skins reaching out here. That's the hole where the pupa left the gall. It does not make sense. Right? Why would a insect destroy its host? So they try to count, you know, to try to understand what's happening, right? Maybe there is another uh, related Daphnandra species where they came from, which would still could, which could mean that the insect survives, but the plant might not. That would be the worst scenario, right? And the parasites just no, are not keeping up. So they still let them actually destroy. So it's a real bottleneck for the plant because they have only very few, few seeds. And they are about maybe five, six populations which are still uh, you know, uh, thriving, still existing. It still could be a uh, co-extinction, still can happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what will happen with, with, uh, with this particular species. Uh, so this is an example of a pest. Now you all know Peruvian li lilies. We grow them, they are beautiful. They are small, big. They are pink, uh, yellow, red, you know. You can buy them as a cut flowers, beautiful. And a farmer uh, in at Forreston here found... Yes, that's right. Yeah, so I named it after him. <laughs> so he found that many of his flowers were kaput, right? <laughs> no flowers, just infestation. So... So he made contact with me via Saudi, who, you know, he talked to them and uh, we were able to rear the, the, uh, the insects because I need males and females and pupae to be able to describe the species and the larvae. So we did that in the end. And you can see here, so from this, instead of these beautiful flowers, you got this tumor with a lot of larvae there. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the adult. Now, this is quite an interesting story because we did that. We did also DNA. You know, see, I, we, we, we sequenced part of the, of the genome, put it on gene bank, you know, into the, uh, the database, and we're about to send for publication the paper. Then we have a call from Queenstown where the same thing happened. So the whole production on a, in, in the glass house system in Queenstown was destroyed. So we again looked at the morphology, we did the DNA, and we're about to send the paper on glass for publication, and we received an email from Netherlands. And they actually did the same. They, they, they sequenced the, the pest, and they had a 100% match with the population, which we put on in gene bank before we actually published the paper. So in the end, we all published this particular uh, uh, the, the description. So the question is, where, where is this gormage coming from? Most likely, it actually traveled with the plants from Peru or Brazil, when these plants were actually brought here. And also, when you look, when I look into the, all the papers, there were reports by the Japanese quarantine where they actually intercepted these plants, uh, the cut flowers, with these larvae. So they had to destroy the, the flowers, but they were just for, just to see if it's a viable population of the insect. They actually were able to rear a adult. So that means, these insects can actually travel, you know, uh, with uh, with uh, with the aeroplanes, and that was happening with the cut flowers from Australia and New Zealand. So now the, the growers know, and that's really the fun part for me as a taxonomy. It's not just a, a beautiful right uh, and and describe a new species, but it actually has an economic importance. So they know what to look for. So they actually had to destroy all the all the crop for the particular year and sterilize the soil because this particular species is going to soil and you face there. So by knowing the biology, you can actually uh, prevent infestation. Now, this is the melanoxylon. 
So Melanoxylum. But we found species on Meansia too. Meansia too. So there, there is there is probably about 30, 40 species which, which feed on, on different acacias. So this particular one, again, these are the healthy flowers and these are the goals. So locally, it can actually stop a particular population of the black bottle from, from uh, sexual reproduction. And that's what the South Africans are using. So they actually, uh, we described the species did the DNA and then they did a, a host specificity test. It took a couple of years to actually let the, 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 the gall mage attack the plants, which they wanted to know if it does, and it didn't. So in the end, it was proven that it actually feeds only on a particular species. So then they introduced it into South Africa. And now currently after about 15 years of introduction, everything uh, you know, looks fine. The insect in, infests only a particular species, this one. It uh, destroys most of the, of the flowers, so it's not reproducing, but it still can grow as a, as a tree because the tree is used for firewood in, in South Africa. Also for tenants, for, you know, for the leather industry, but still there's a large population of people who depend on the wood. So there was a dilemma, you know, what to do. The ecology didn't want the... Uh, the water to spread everywhere, and it was. So they actually uh, destroyed the plants, the, the trees in the area they didn't want it, and now these insects actually helps them to contain it in the area they, uh, they are happy to have it. So you can see here, this is from South Africa. That's nothing. So I, I went to a conference, and people from South Africa were there. Were, 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 were. And they said, I'll be working on these Dacinera ruby formis. And I said, I named the species. Do you like the name very much? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it puts people together from different areas of, of, of science and, and industry. And these are, you know, the drawings. So I have a, a camera lucida, which is a drawing tube. So I cut the species under microscope uh, in a tiny pieces that goes through different chemicals and then in Canada balsam. And then I draw the, uh, you know, the different parts. Uh, we did the DNA for this one too, and then compare to existing species. This is the other way around. This is a plant which is called the bellyache, Jatropha. It's a plant that grows originally in South America. Has been introduced to Australia, I think in the last century, and it's just taking over the natural environment of Queensland, and it's poisonous. So when the cattle eats that, they have you know poisoning of the, of the stomach. So now the idea is, and it's paid by the Queensland government, they're looking in South America for species of insects that can actually put a pressure on this particular species. I mean, science learns learns to a certain degree, we know we should not introduce a polyphagous species that would eat everything, right? It creates only more problems. But this is one of the organisms where uh, the existence of species is there for millions of years. So there is no very low chance that it would actually start eating a different species. And before that, there is a screening for the host specificity. So these pictures here are from, this is a picture from Queensland. Mm -hmm but the rest is from South America. So they actually, the Australians uh, together with Argentinians and people from Paraguay went there, looked for these insects and some of them, uh, so this particular was in the area I worked. So I actually described the species with, with, with them. So we did the morphology, did the DNA and they did the first testing in South Africa for the specificity. And now they're going to, that's a plan, they're going to, take it to quarantine uh, glass houses in Queensland, where they're going to further test uh, for host specificity. So you, you can see here, this is this, this does not stop the plant from reproducing. It just puts pressure on the habitus, on the plant itself. So here you see a, a bud of the, of the leaf here, and you can see the larvae here. And then once the larvae go to the soil, the whole bud dies. 
So it does not stop the plant entirely, but it puts pressure on it. And you know, if the plant has a bottleneck dryness or whatnot, it would actually uh, diminish its population. So it's like a multi, uh, multi-agent uh, 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 tactics to put several species which are specific, which put the plant under under the pressure. Uh, so many of these insects are really a, a, a serious pest. And mango, I, I help people from different countries to actually identify and also describe the species they find. And one of the plants is mango. It's very popular. You know, it's one of the, pop, uh, you know, the popular plants on this planet. So in India, Indonesia, mango is very important. And there are probably about 30, 35 described species and about 30 undescribed. So I'm bombarded you know, on every year, two or three new species, uh, you know, which, which people find and they're destroying the, the local, uh, the local uh, farming industry. Most of these species create, so these, all these species are from a single genus of the niche and feeding on a single plant species. So you can have a scenario where you have one plant species and several gonogies, which is such a good host, right? Uh, and you can, most of them are fortunately destroying on the, the, the leaves, which is a, a, a problem too, because if it's a sink, so if, if, if many of the leaves are actually malformed, transformed, they cannot work properly. And then it's, it's an entry for a, a secondary fungi. So it's, it put the plant under pressure, but it still can actually survive. Some of the species actually infest the, flower, uh, the, uh, the, the fruits, like this one from, from uh, uh, Philippines. And this is one which we described two years ago, which destroys the young fruits. So you have nothing. And you know, that's not good. So uh, the first step would probably be destroying uh, a, 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 the focus of the, of the population of the image and see if you can stop it. So this is the part, because I wrote on, my, on, the, on, the, on the information about my talk that I would show you how to find a new species because you can do it, right? You can actually find a species which we can describe because most of them are not described. So when you go to Morialta here, I probably would need about a day or half a day to find a species which has no name. Mm -hmm. And you can do it too. So you look for these malformations. Now they can be caused by other insects or other organisms too. So. Those I work with, when you crack them open, they should be colorful. They should be about probably one to two millimeters big. They need to have the spatula, the chitinized structure. They should be either pink, orange, or, or red, sometimes white too, right? So that, and if you tell me, show me the picture, you know, I just check in the database, I tell you, this is species which has not been described and named. Right? Then, uh, this one is actually this one here. We sent the pay the paper for publication uh, two weeks ago, and that was again with people who are naturalists, you know. And I received material from different parts of southern Australia, so from people who are walkers and they actually you know just tourists, and they I navigate them how to how to how to rear it, how to get the males and females and also from um, the, uh, the rangers from uh, national parks. So this one has been sent for publication. This one is a new species, we have no name. This is from, from Queenstown. Um, you can argue it's beautiful, right? So imagine, and you know, they look very similar. So imagine the cocktail, I mean, just the, the chemistry of it, which people are not studying uh, as, as you know, intensely yet, you know, just the cocktail of these, uh, cytokines that actually causes this particular gods. So these, these undescribed species. So the next step when you find a new species, you need to get males and females. And that's sometimes easy, sometimes not. If it's the, these 8,000 species of gormages, they create two heterogeneous groups. One where they pupate in the gall, and those which actually have to go to the soil. These are problematic. That's not easy to, to get them, but you can. So if you see one, 
which which we are lucky enough. And you see one which creates the goals, you know, on on the plant. You just get the the the, the branch, put it into into you know the the pot with water. You put plastic bag around. And you wait for the males and females to appear, and they put them into seventy percent ethanol or gin or whatever. You know, you need more than fifty percent ethanol, right? So to preserve them. Oh, I just need a little bit. <laughs> so for those who you paid, you just bought, you know, you buy two bottles just in case you, you find <laughs> Few they would be happy. <laughs> so the second group is more difficult to rear. Uh, you need to actually crack open the, uh, the, the goals and let the larvae go into the soil. Or just put the larvae on the soil and they would actually uh, open the gauze for themselves and go into the soil. Now, the giveaway between these two species here, here is the, the species that pupate in a goal, they are lazy. They just, right? you open them, they don't go anywhere. But those that pupate in the soil, they are like predators, they move around because they are really a species that need to move. So then, based on the past movement of these larvae, you actually can guess. This is one the species where I need a jar and I need, need a damp sand. Not wet, not dry, just sort of wet. And they, you let them, you know, you put them on the soil. They, they go about one centimeter deep. And then they, uh, after three weeks, uh, they, 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 they pupate. Mm -hmm. Some species are very difficult. This one here, I found for the first time in 1993, and I could not get it. I could not get adults. But a naturalist in uh, Snowy Mountains, she actually did it. It took her... 10 months to actually rear it. She had it in soil in an unheated room for 10 months. So some are difficult, but that's extreme. Normally it's, it's much easier. So I think that's all. I just have a couple of pictures. If we have time, just show you some uh, goals. This is on Ruby Solbush. Right. I put more on my neck. Right. I do not check because I have so much material, right? But we actually published uh, the the information from iNaturalist in in papers. So if you do that, you know it's a locality, and uh, so it, it's a wonderful thing. So this is the ruby salt bush, right? The, the the you can eat the the, the fruits, can't you? Yeah. yeah, right. More than once, not not poisonous. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is called Asfondilia tonsura. This is Asfondilia mcnalia. We have a person here after whom the, the, the insect was named. Any? <laughs> Any? And? <laughs> so you can see, uh, it's really, the goal is quite elaborate. So I think this particular one is a transformation or malformation of the the leaf which is this here see how different it is mm -hmm. so the larva you know it feeds on the plant injects the cytokines and the plant responds by creating this goal this is uh the blood the salt bush so the goals are here 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 this is a healthy fruit This one is just beautiful. It does not put pressure on the plant too much. It's not that common, but it's quite striking. So this one has a little bit wider hose range. I think it it feeds on uh, probably five species uh, related to waffles. Now this is this is very special. Uh, a uh, a colleague Luke Halling from the quarantine or what was called quarantine about eight years ago in Northern Territory. So they're checking for uh, pests coming from Indonesia, from Papua New Guinea, right? And he found these goals, they're pretty boring. So these are the goals here, 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 on the three-leafed bush grape, called Sonis trifolia, or Kairatia trifolia it used to be. And he was able to get the males and females and he sent it to me. And when I realized, to which branch of Gornages these species belong, I was stunned. 
because that particular branch, which is a sister group in phylogeny to other Golmages, split from other Golmages 100 and 110 million, million years ago. This is the first species that actually uh, is eating plant, not fungi, but plant, and it actually is causing a gall. So this is really the phylogenetically the oldest species that are actually causing galls on this planet. So this actually shifts the time uh, when gall midges start doing the galls to 100, 110 million years back in the Cretaceous. So despite being quite boring, it's really quite exciting. I mean, from pure scientific point of view, right? This plant, it's, it's a wheat, right? We tried to recollect it. So we were collecting in Northern Territory, Queensland. I actually sacrificed my uh, pool time in Bali to look through <laughs> We could not find it. So it, it's like, it, you know, with butterflies too, right? Sometimes they are there, then you can't find them. So if you find uh, the three-leaf bush grape and these girls, just keep them, put them in the, into, into, in the plastic bag and let me know. And this is a, this is a species I found, you know, during a family holidays. This is in Threadbot Diggins. This is the small fruit hake here. You see the, the goals here? In Europe, you have groups like you who are collecting goals, right? Because they are colorful, they have interesting structures, right? It's, we like putting things into boxes, right? Not just when you have German blood a little bit, you know, but also, you know, classification and people like the, the, the structures. So this one was found in snowy mountains. Uh, this is this is a species which USDA is thinking of introducing to the to the USA to to uh, to control the swamp she oak. Now, what I want to show you here is the pupa, which is a frontal view here and a lateral view here. Instead of having just one CT here, it's like a whole array, right? Yes. So when I describe a genus, I use the uh, ancient Greek language for the description of the, of the genus, and then Latin. So Greek is more important than Latin in this case, right? Uh, so I call it ophelmodiplosis, and you can see the etymology here. So ophelma means broom in, uh, in, in, in Greek, which looks like a broom, right? Like when you sweep your, your garden. So, you know, that's what you do. You know, you, you, you try to, to use descriptive names. Right. I mean, fewer and fewer people know Latin, right? And no, who knows, you know, the, the ancient Greek, but you know, scientists, it's beautiful, right? And diplosis mean a uh, two nodded antenna. So these this genus have an antenna, which consists of 12 segments and each is created by, by two nodes with a, with a, with a, with a neck. And there they have all these chemical sensoria, you know, the, the seat, it just check the wind. Uh, so, so that's how you, and the clavata means again, Latin, cl clavus means club. Because it looks like a club, right? If you look, look here, see this one here and this one. Uh, this is species where, we described from uh, from uh, National Park west of Golden Gold Coast National Parks there. Uh, can't remember. Lake. Yes, yes, that's right. Leamington and another one. Yes. So from from that part of the world, right? And however, uh, the species has been recorded from Indonesia from 1920s. And you can see the original picture here from 1926 by husband and wife, the Dutch who worked in, uh, in a botanical garden of Butensok. So again, you know, and all three plant species grow everywhere. So they, they grow from Indonesia to East, North and, and Eastern Australia.
and this is the kangaroo apple. I mean, it's it's not used in industry, right? People, so it's not a pest. It, it's really, uh, it's a wild plant. This one is one of the USDA, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture projects, where they pay people here in Australia to look for potential control agents. And they have a big problem with the paperback because it just takes over the southern uh, Florida. It's the biggest weed on this planet, 40 meters there. So it grows higher there than here. So they try to put pressure on the plant. And one of the possibilities is this particular species, which we named Contarinia melaluke. So the, the specific name I often use after the genus of the plant. So, you know, it, it, it gives you the, the, uh, the association with the host plant. The, the genus, you know, if it's, if it's existing, you just, you know, use it. You can, you know, uh, there, are, there are two types of taxonomies, those who want to split and create new genera or those who do lumps. I'm a lumpy, so that is called. I try to keep uh, as few uh, genera as possible. Because there are so many here, you know, uh, if they have, if there's any reason to keep it in the same genus, I do. And I think I have two more slides. This is a species from uh, South Africa. And that's the one which is this huge wingspan, six millimeters each wing, so one and a half centimeters a bit with, with the thorax together, enormous. And it destroyed, and it's a pit grass, which is a is a weed here. So maybe in the future, you know, people can test the whole specificity, which with grass is, is really, one has to do a really good homework, homework, not to introduce species that can actually go to others. You know, so, so here you can see the healthy, healthy uh, stems like that, and that's a goal. And here you can see the, the pupa inside, pupa skins. So this is all South Africa, this is Australia. So possibly can be considered. This is uh, a species we described from New Zealand. There is a myrtle rust, I'm, I'm sure you know. So it destroys the endemic tree, which they call Ramarama, Lophomyrtus bulata. And it's really, it's taking toll of the, of the population of, of, of the plant. And on the rust, they found a gall midge which was eating the rust. Mm. Now, we don't know if it's a goodie or baddie because it eats the, the, the spores, but there's a possibility that the, when the female emerges, it takes some spores and takes it to another plant. So we don't know, you know, mm. if, but we want to know the population, sorry, the, the life history of, of, of the disease, of the, of the, of the fungus. And this is, this is part of it. And you know it's a complex thing. You have the plant, you have the the fungus, you have the gourmet, you have the parasites of this. It's it's a network. And this is the the species from China. This is from North East China. So they grow a lot of mangoes there. And we are currently describing the Indian guys a species which is similar. So there's a lot of interest in in, in mango species. The taxonomy in this taxonomy in these countries is it's still not as it has to be. So you know I'm happy to help them, but it's getting more and more difficult material from these countries. And I think uh, this is this species destroys the the road greenery in in, in Beijing, which is called Peking in Chinese. So we, we named the genus after the city Peking or Mia. Mia means. Uh, uh, fly in Greek. So it's the, the Beijing fly eating on syringes, which is the, the, the lilac. And you can see here, maybe not. Many, many leaves actually uh, fell down. So when, you know, the Beijing people walk, they have a lot of dead leaves, they don't like it. So again, at least we know what it is. Uh, goji berry, very popular here too. So it's a big industry in China. And, you know, if you're a, a grower, a farmer, you would not be happy with this here because that should be a, a, a seed. So this is a pest. And see, pink, nice color, but it's a pest. Okay, last slide. If you ever go to Lake Toba in, sorry? Yes. 
Yes, now this is a mystery, right? So when I when I did the uh, review of the Indonesian colleges, right, I received materials from wherever they placed it. This particular was thing in Washington. The original description says that this gourmet is a predator of the uh, mining moth. You can see the moth, and these are the the mines which the lava digs, right? And they found enormous amount of gourmets in vicinity of these mines. That's the only connection we have between these two species. So, despite you know, in, in a review I write, this is what people found, but it has to be actually checked again, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, Lake Toba is the biggest volcanic lake on the planet. It's huge, it's enormous. So it's just in the center of Sumatra, between Archer and, and Singapore, I think. So should you go there, check. <laughs> So assume biology is that the larvae of the scormage would eat on the larvae of the of, of, of the moth, but who knows? That's the last one. How how weird is that, right? Yes. <laughs> no, they actually write there that the larvae survive the uh, the digesting juices inside the pitcher plant. So they actually, they survive this acidity or whatnot, and then they crawl up and pupate, you know, in, in, when they are dry. So they, they could be toughy. So it's, it's, a, it's complex, right? It's a yes. And when you are pressed to survive, you know, many species, those who don't adapt, they're not here, right? So I am... Pessimistic. I don't think it it feeds on the on the mining uh, 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 moth, but it still could be true what they wrote in the papers in 1931. Now I know you all are butterflies, and so do I. <laughs> so this picture here, 1840, and this is a picture of me in nine, 1985 when I was in the Czechoslovak army. I mean, this was during the Cold War, but you know, we were really not that fearsome. <laughs> that was the officer. So in a tank, I could put a lot of stuff, right? So I had the the Higgins uh, uh, key to uh, to um, to butterflies of Europe, and this one. Now, have a look at the development, right? Have a look at the size of the net, right? <laughs> so in what 145 years, the size changed from from this here to that one. So there's a progress in science. And on that note, I, I finish. Thank you very much. We'll just finish the chair, and then we'll take some questions. Well, look, that was a fabulous presentation, Peter. I'm sure there are lots of questions uh, in addition to all that. Uh, have we got any questions from the floor? Are there any questions from Zoom? No, no, no. Yes, Bob. Why, we'll repeat the question. The way the female only um, gives birth to one sex, does anybody understand? No. no. <laughs> and there are only. He's not doing that. No. 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 Good. No. So we don't know. And there are only under 10 papers that actually they show it because people don't care. Anymore. But when you are actually trying to breed rear species <laughs> and you have only two leaves in these goals, right? Or just one, and you say you need at least one male and one female, ideally five. And you get only males or females, you know, you start thinking. And that which makes you actually anticipate that. And then when you are uh, when, when, when you find another species, you should try looking. So we are just trying to understand if that's the case for all the images or just the couple we, we know of. So that the, the genetics are not known. Is anybody speculating on what? No, nobody can. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to wonder how they, how they manage.
Yeah, you can see that. Okay, yeah. so we've got yeah. question from the floor. Yes, thank you, Gary. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'm wondering, the wondering about the interaction between the uh, so the question is, is yeah. the question is, is there an interaction between ants and the gourmet lab? Yeah, like in uh, Lysinidae, right? Yeah. Like in uh, the blue, blue, blue butterfly, right? I don't know of any, no, no, no. I would expect the ants would eat them. That's why they jump. But they do, because they're inside, right? They do not secret sugar, uh, uh, sugar water, right? Like some of uh, the gold making insects do, and also aphids, right? But these are actually hidden inside. So I do not know of the interaction or the positive interaction between the ants and the, the gourmet. We know that birds, you know, realize uh, that there is say, a nice larvae inside the gourmet. So they crack them open and, and, and feed on them. Don't know about the ants. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is a mechanical question, but you've got the black wattle. Here in South Australia, it just has a, and the mature plants have a, just a simple pillow, but the ones that you showed on your, on your pictures have a divided pillow, uh, which uh, in, our species, in our local variety only happens on the mature part. They, the same one, I, I don't know what's going on. So the, the black wattle that was shown there is Acacia manzii, which is from the uh, eastern side of Australia, and then it went to South, it was taken to South Africa for the tanning industry. But you are questioning the ID of the plant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Look. Uh, that's right. So well, that's there's, the there's a problem with common names. Yeah. Oh, I've got black wattle. On the, on the slide. Yeah. The, the Latin name. It might just be the wrong name on the Latin could be that I did uh, the name wrongly yeah. but uh, generally any description of the species we have a authoritative species description sorry uh, identification so yeah. if that's a case uh, maybe I, I have to look into we'll the check. paper just yeah. make sure make, make sure so I'm not a botanist so I I, I cannot answer the uh, the question. But everything where we describe the, the species has to be identified you know, by a, a specialist because the host plant is part of the description and it matters. It's very important. Yeah. I have a question from Zoom. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Stephanie Domi Guy, it's coming from Michael Burrow, is asking Jeffrey and I that there are 12 species from 220 observations. Of Exactly for the only family of gorgeous. Uh, yes, as for the diptera, uh, that's the only family that, that does gorse, but there are several other families in, in Hymenoptera that do the gorse too. Uh, Dini. So, what was that point? Yes. That's a question I, I well, let me just, just repeat that. Um, what time is the best season or best time of year to collect gold images? Anytime. So I, you know, after about 15 years of collecting here, now I don't collect, I have no time because I have so much material, right? So I actually did a, a Excel graph where I plotted the date with the number of species I found. And there is a, there is a more species because you need to find the species active. You need to have the mature larvae. So they are not there all the time. They are there probably, if it's, if a species is only one generation, you have only a window of about a month to get it. If it's three generations, it's, it's longer. So the, the season matters. So generally you can find it any time of the year, but it's mainly in, uh, in, in late spring. But any time you can, you can, you know, you can find them. And anytime you can actually find them in the live development, which allows us to actually describe it, because very likely you find a species which has no name, right? So 
you need to get a larvae in a stage where they ate and we would get the, the adults because that's that's the base of the, of the taxonomy i mean most of these species because we are just starting you know stretching the surface are known only from the type locality you know so from one one place and only now if they are naturalists that's a good thing right because they are they are quite strange these these these, these goals and they are actually just looking at the structure and the color you can tell what species it is so i'm expecting actually by popularizing you know uh the structures that people would start mm. Uh, actually finding them and we can actually fill in the 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 the, the distribution the geographical distribution I, I don't know does anything look small yeah, crack it open well, i haven't gone that far yet oh you have to uh, so keep your nails your fingernails <laughs> crack it open and uh if it's one of mine it would be an, uh, a, a, a pink color you know yellow whatever and it would have probably have been the spectral stand up which you can see with see with the naked eye so I used 10 times, 20 times field uh, magnifying glass, but even without that, I, I can see. Mm -hmm. All right, look, thank you very much, Peter. It has been a very engaging and, and amusing in some time. Nobody fall asleep. No, no, very <laughs> engaging. <laughs> uh, and we'd like to thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.